Well, our next guest this morning is David Pryor, one of Australia's leading businessmen with business interests and corporate experience across a range of sectors. Alongside his father, Malcolm, David was the founder of sustainable packaging group Baruda, which sold to packaging giant Vizzy in 2007. He also founded 5AM Organics, a market leading producer and supplier of organic foods in 2009, and sold that business in 2014 for some $80 million. Outside of his corporate positions, David and wife Sally are heavily involved in the philanthropic sector via the Prior Family Foundation, a not-for-profit organisation focused on preservation of the environment, wildlife and cultures. He also purchased the Bladnock Distillery in Scotland, a 200-year-old single malt Scotch whisky producer in the Scottish Lowlands that had fallen into administration the previous year. David, it's a pleasure having you as a guest this morning. Thanks for your time. Let's begin with the current state of the economy. Recent ABS statistics have shown that liquor sales in the domestic economy for 2020 up by a third to $15.6 billion as compared with 2019 levels. What's your sort of reading on the economy at the moment? Yeah, I mean, for us uh, in the space that we're in, it's sort of a two-paced thing because whilst actually alcohol consumption has increased, um, through lockdown periods, and we've certainly increased revenues by in the order of 50%. There's also been a pullback in the global scotch category of something like 25%. And I think that's been on the back of a couple of things, Brexit, uh, the US tariffs, and also just general COVID, you know, restrictions on freight, all those sorts of things which are now really biting. And so we're saying it's hard to really pick I would say there's a lot of people that are maybe static and there's a lot that have gone backwards. If you're heavily exposed or if you're heavily distributed through bars, clubs and restaurants, then of course your sales have come back significantly. We're more focused in the supermarkets and in through Dan Murphy's and those talk, sorts of liquor retailers. So we've probably seen the upside of it without too much downside, but there's a lot going on and it's hard to just say one way or another whether it's been a positive side or a, or a negative side for the liquor industry. And of course, as you know, globally, it's been a horrible time for so many businesses, but there's some strange winners as well. So it's hard to pick. You know, there's been furniture, there's been, of course, domestic travel's a big one at the moment. I was saying the used car market is up, you know, substantially. So you can't quite pick sometimes what's gonna come up and what's gonna suffer. Uh, look, but we're hoping that it, it turns and that everyone gets to get back to where they were because obviously this is not a good time with, you know, with shutdowns and restrictions and, and just generally a tougher biz business environment for everybody, I think. Um, but the one that's come out of the blue that we're finding at the moment is supply chain. So I think we're finding with packaging, with freight, uh, freight forwarding, shipping times, that's really starting to bite. I think you're finding a lot of you know, out of stocks you know, across all sorts of categories and that's of course driving up prices and so that's, that one's playing out at the moment. We're seeing our supply, t supply lead times have gone from you know, four to six weeks to double that uh, over the past six months. So we'll see how that goes. And how have you managed to navigate the challenges of the past 12 months, obviously, with interests in Scotland and you're based in Australia? How have you sort of managed to navigate that? I mean, look, it's having a business in the <laughs> southern part of Scotland and, and living in Melbourne was probably, has been a bigger challenge than I envisaged. I guess I thought with video conferencing and all those things that it'd be eminently doable uh, and it has been but it has been tough. It's been we don't have great connectivity down there it's quite a rural location we're on 60 acres of beautiful land down in the south you know the Gal next to the Galloway State Forest so it's not like it's a you know, it's not an IT hub so getting everything set up and, and being able to have you know sort of seamless video calls with a team the management team of of 12 or 15 people or whatever from multiple locations is tough. And the past 12 months has exacerbated that. But I think in some ways we were kind of, you know, whilst people have had to scramble to get, you know, their meeting structures and out of home and all that set up, we're already doing all of that because, you know, we're in Melbourne, business is in Scotland. Um, my marketing team sit here, my production team sit there, my master distiller who's also involved in the brand sits there. So there's a lot of, connectivity between different parts of the world and so therefore we were already all set up from home, working from home, everyone had the Zoom, everyone was doing all of that. We had our regular meeting and governance cycle, you know, 
10 things that we had to do every month and then and so we sort of we we slotted into the whole covid connection you know new world i think a lot easier than a, than a lot of people because we're already so di you know diverse in our in our locations and all of that and look it's been a challenge for everybody uh, but I think we've adapted really well. And in terms of Bladnock as a business, what markets have you seen particularly strong growth in in the past and what markets do you see or forecast strong growth in, in the future? Whiskey category is generally growing strongly globally. Uh, it's been through a period for the last five years of strong growth. Single malts are probably the biggest subsection of that growth in which Bladnock is a single malt. So we've come into a category that's got a lot of, you know, sort of tailwind behind it and it's going in the right direction. The strong markets are, you know, the US, of course, China, India is a strong market. For us, Bladnock's been probably strongest in Germany, Australia, the US, these types of markets, whereas Pure Scott, which is our blended whisky, has been strongest in Israel and a couple of you know, more different markets. So can't quite just singly say that you know, a market has been the best. China's been very good for us as well. It's a difficult market, but we've got a great partner there. You know, as much as anything in our game, as it is with many, your distribution partner, your partner on the ground is so key. If you get the right partner, then you can really build a market. If you get the wrong partner, you, you're years behind, you know. And we've had a couple of false starts in the US, but we've now got a good arrangement there as well. And we're finding that it's really growing strongly and, you know, we're up in the sort of 100% region, whereas for a while there, we were growing by nominal amounts. So I think as much as anything, it's, it's getting that team right, you know, getting your, um, your own team, your own, HR set up right and then having the right partnerships to build on into those markets. In relation to your philanthropic efforts, you're heavily involved in the sector through the Prior Family Foundation and also Culture is Life. Where, where are resources being most, uh, alloc or where are you allocating resources most over the past, say, 12 months? Where are they really needed? Look, yeah, the Prior Foundation, which as you said in, your, in the pre preamble, was set up for around the core theme of preservation of culture, the environment and wildlife. And we can't, wildlife is one we just continually, we work with the Irwin family, uh, who are incredible people and environmentalists. And we work on rhino conservation in Kenya and um, the Sumatran tigers in Indonesia. And uh, we've been working with them for five years. It's a great relationship. The other two areas are probably the key, um, preservation of culture and preservation of the environment. Preservation of culture is 100% focused on indigenous culture and uh, through an organisation called Culture is Life. And, you know, it's an area that gets quite a bit of funding already from government, but not in terms of the way we're funding. Government will go in and work in a community around specific areas, might be health issues or whatever. We're taking the other approach, rather than trying to treat some of the effects, we're saying, you know, what, what are the causes here? And we think that the whole dislocation of culture for this, you know, incredibly ancient, culture that's been here 40,000 years, they've sort of grown for all the things that have happened in Australia over the past 200 years, they've grown away from their culture. And so our thing is all about getting them back. It's a totally Indigenous run organisation, it's not us. We fund it, I sit on the board, but you know, there, it's an Indigenous board, it's Indigenous CEO, it's in, and it's about sharing and celebrating in their ancient wisdom and culture, and at a very grassroots level. Um, some of it is social media activated, some of it is actually work out in the community. But the central belief is, and you see a lot of this now if you read into the space, that when people are strong in their own culture and in their own connection to family, to the land, to language, there's much, much lower rates of mental health issues and in the case of Indigenous, uh, much lower rates of youth suicide. And so our central thing is around youth suicide, but it's the way we work with it is through the preservation of culture. And the environment one is mainly focused up on the Great Barrier Reef. And so we work with citizens of the Great Barrier Reef and Greening Australia. Last year we did kind of, you know, we diverted maybe half a million dollars into bushfire efforts because of obviously everything that went on last January and replanting efforts with greening. But normal business is up around the, the Great Barrier Reef and focused a bit on runoff. So there's all the industrial farms up there where the runoff is coming through and eroding the gullies and running sediment, massive sediment build up onto the reef. And so we're working in, in that region to restore the gullies 
and to get the reef back to health because, you know, as you, again, as you might have read, the reef's kind of on a knife's edge at the moment. 50% of it's in pretty good health and 50% of it's really bleached and by many definitions is dying. And so that's a real concern, I would have thought, for, for, for the world, but for Australia in particular. And so that's where we're focusing our efforts. Let's talk about David Pryor, the person you grew up on the Mornington Peninsula. What are some of your earliest childhood memories? Yeah, probably very kind of um, uncommon childhood, I think. Mum and Dad, who'd come out, you know, new immigrants to the country in the late 60s, started their own business in the mid 70s. So, you know, we weren't uh, holidaying down on, <laughs> down at Portsea over the holidays. We were working in Mum and Dad's factory and like genuinely working, not mucking around, helping them pack boxes and and we started doing that when I was seven and when my sister was nine and we'd go in there and help out. And that was just kind of the family unit. And so we didn't think that it was, you don't think it's odd when you're that age and you've just, and you do that. And so it was, you know, we had an amazing family and very tight upbringing. Uh, but it was very much focused around the family that was, you know, investing their time and resources or their time and efforts into building a business and, and trying to get ahead in a new country. So it was, it was probably typical of a new migrant family in the country. It's not so much about school sport because it's about trying to carve out a niche for yourself in the country, which is what, exactly what mum and dad were trying to do, and which they did. They did successfully and they built up a, a business which they sold to Amcor before we started Baroda. You know, it was a nice business. And then we started Baroda, dad and I, in the mid-90s and ran it for a decade and sold it to Vizzy. And again, you know, learned an enormous amount through that experience. The childhood part was, um, and my daughter and I spend every, every free weekend or whatever we get together surfing. And you know, my, my dad's probably honestly never stepped on a beach in his life, <laughs> despite the fact that we grew up on the peninsula and all that. So incredibly different upbringings. But, you know, loved it and got taught incredible lessons and. Some people get taught to kick a footy early. Some people get taught to surf. I think I was getting taught how to run a business the whole time. I was probably even just without knowing it, but that's what was the prevalent thing in our household was, you know, it was business. So that was my childhood. <laughs> Following graduation from Haileybury College, you attended Monash University, completing a bachelor's degree in business and commerce before later completing an MBA at Melbourne Business School. Talk to me about David Pryor as a student. You sort of touched on it there, your interest in, in business, but expand on that. You're saying you watched one of the Haileybury interviews, won an award, Alumni of the Year or something, a couple of years back, and when we were talking about that, I said, you know, Definitely not the model student. Like, if you're hoping that I was like the, the perfect student that went on to be, you know, reasonably successful in business and stuff, I wasn't. I was definitely more the kind of mucking around, being a kid, you know, okay at most things, but, you know, not outstanding at any of them, to be honest. I was, I was really, and I look back now, of course, with the benefit of hindsight and wisdom, and I was truly just being a, a you know, a 15 year old or a 17 year old. and girls and you know a bit of sport and a bit of mucking around and all that sort of stuff with a with a focus and doing enough to make sure I could get to uni I was always kind of you know sort of making sure that there was enough headroom there to get through get to uni and then obviously to qualify to get to the MBA was another stepping stone I sort of feel like I timed my run pretty well because what I have also seen I guess through life is you get a lot of kids that are very 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 serious at a very young age incredible students or incredible athletes and and burn out as well very quickly and by their mid-20s they're done you know mid-30s they're finished I mean I, I don't think that I mean, it's an interesting of course dynamic now we have a 12 year old daughter and of course you want to encourage them to do well but I don't think we, certainly for us, we don't push her to the point of, you know, you have to be outstanding in sport, you have to be outstanding. So you want her to do well, but I want her to be a 12-year-old girl, which is exactly what she is, you know. And when she, a bit later on, yeah, do the best you can, but enjoy yourself as well. You've got to be where you are at that time, because life's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, you know, I think it's important that she enjoys that, she comes surfing, she's a balanced human being already. I think that's more important. And I can see, she's got an entrepreneurial brain already. I can see the way she thinks, the questions she asks me. She might end up being an entrepreneur, who knows? She's certainly got the genetics for it. But when I look back, again, I was kind of, you know, I was being a 
being a kid and being a young adult at the times and even through uni sort of doing enough and you know getting decent marks but having a hell of a lot of fun along the way as well. <laughs> And just on the MBA part, what are the key learnings or, or takeaways that you took out from that experience? It's an interesting one. I, I kind of, I actually went and did an MBA because we were starting Baroda, Dad and I, and I was aware that if it didn't go well, in other words, if it, if it went broke, I'd need to go and get a good job somewhere. And I thought having an MBA would set me above, you know, just having a business degree sort of things, and which was a very uncommon reason to do an MBA. Most of the people in business schools, like Melbourne, are sort of um, consultants or middle level managers wanting to take that next step in a corporate. Very, very few are coming in with an entrepreneurial thinking. They want to build a business or they want to, you know, like we were doing, trying to build that family business. I found it, again, I would say an invaluable experience. Melbourne was a very good institution at that time, was consistently sort of top 30 MBA schools in the world. But I don't think that you learn, you certainly don't learn how to start a business, become an entrepreneur, uh, build a business, and how you can navigate all the challenges that business throws up through doing an MBA. In some ways, I think that would be naive to think that you're going to learn how to run a business. It's much, much more about becoming a good, upper level manager, you know, it's around having a broad um, understanding of accounting, all the different things, you know, finance, marketing, HR, and therefore you're a person that can go on to become a consultant or a top level manager in one of these corporates. I don't know if you can really teach entrepreneurship and things. I think that, you know, entrepreneurship is more about personal qualities. Maybe if you read enough books about incredible entrepreneurs like Richard Branson and things, Elon Musk, you probably get some real valuable life lessons out of that. Because I think entrepreneurship's much more about, you know, identifying an opportunity, taking the risk, taking the plunge, taking the risk, and then sticking to your guns, you know, because you'll get buffeted and you come up with so many challenges when you build your own business. And so it's much more about a mindset. You know, so for me, I don't really read business books. I tend to read like sporting autobiographies and things. I find that really interesting. How they've overcome the challenges in their life. You know, Andre Agassi, when he, he'd won three and then he got divorced and ended up, he was ranked 141 and he was doing the challenger circuit. And then he comes back and won, wins another five majors. Incredible story of, you know, persistence, of believing in yourself. And I think all those qualities are actually more important when it comes to being an entrepreneurial type business. Different if you're running a department of a major bank or something, but if you're gonna go out and identify an opportunity and actually go for it and build a business, I see much more parallels on that side of things than in, in a business text. You became CEO of the family business Baroda, I think in the late 1990s, and were CEO up until 2007 upon the business selling to Visi Group. Talk to me about the, the growth strategy and how did you position the business to make it an attractive takeover target? Yeah, it's funny because you say I was the CEO and I remember when I, so I finished, graduated in, as you say, 99, you know, freshly minted MBA from the Melbourne Business School and I said to Dad, oh, well, you know, CEO now and so what do you reckon, what, what's my new job? He goes, oh, I think you need to go out and get some accounts otherwise you won't have a business to run. So I was the most qualified salesman in the history, you know, of like uh, of business because, and the reality is when you're running, again, you're running your own business, you're building a business, no point having the fancy title. All we needed at that stage was accounts. So I went out and, you know, it was bloody hard. We had literally no business. We'd entered a, entered a category which was dominated by Visi and a couple of other players and we were a startup. And, you know, your dad had a bit of money from the previous sale of his business, but that was running out real quick. And so I had to go out and get accounts and you learn really fast what, you know, you need to do to get those accounts. So, and we got National Foods, we got Boral, we got CSR, we got some yogurt companies, but they took a long time. When they started coming, they came much faster because then you'd say, well, we've, we just won Boral and CSR would say, well, maybe you could do our work. And so we found that we got a, we got a kind of run on and we, then we went through sort of 01, 02, 03, 04, we built really quickly and we won fastest manufacturer and growing manufacturer in Australia, I think two years in a row with BRW and we went from zero to 25 or 30 million turnover in that period. You know, then I think really the thing around selling to a big competitor like Visi, I think we were just a pain in the butt. We were winning a lot of accounts. 
we were winning really good accounts, kind of like the, the key ones. We were always tendering against those guys. And I think eventually you just, you know, when there's a bit of mutual signalling that you're ready to, you're ready to, or you're happy to exit, then I think it wasn't so much about, as you might with a branded goods business, about positioning something that might fit into a, an acquirer's portfolio. I think that's a bit different in a business like that, which was essentially a commodities business because you're, you know, you're manufacturing packaging and putting a label and selling it. It's not highly branded like whiskey, for example. It's a different mindset, but certainly if you've won enough accounts that they wanted, then you, you know, you're going to be an attractive you know, takeover target, which is ultimately what happened and, and we were able to sell to them in yeah, you know, 07. They were great to deal with and did a nice transaction. And then Malcolm, my father, stayed on there to run that business for a, quite a few years. I had a little while to think about, now what do I want to do? Because, you know, 37 and you think you know a bit and actually you don't know that much, even though, again, I'd been CEO and actually helped really, really grown that business a lot with Dad. And when you go out on your own own, not, <laughs> and you realise another whole learning curve, because you go, OK, this is kind of different again. And, you know, there's definitely times there after, like, 08, 09, before I'd started 5am, where I thought, God, I don't really think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I've got some crazy idea about a yoghurt, you know, which I really know nothing about, except that I think it's a good category and I like yoghurt and knew a bit of the dynamics around organic food and things. Ultimately, you've got to say, well, I suppose I better give it a go because, you know, the worst thing you can do is stand still. You know, again, it's like one of those sporting analogies. That you overthink things, you know, that's the worst thing you can do. Out in the surf, if there's a wave coming, you've got to go in or you've got to go out. If you stand still, you, you know, you just sit on your board, you're going to get cleaned up. But one of my big beliefs is just make a choice and go for it. Might be wrong, but at least you're in action and you're moving. And so I think that was that process before 5am of saying, you know what, there's probably a lot of things I'm not going to do right, but let's just get on with it. And so that, that was ultimately how we decided to move into that organic yoghurt space. So just in terms of the origins of 5am yoghurt, what, what niche or gap did you identify in the market and, and what sort of research did you go through? There's mainly two things. One is um, I sort of came out of the family packaging business and thought, what skill set have I got? And a lot of people were saying, in fact, most people that I respected were saying, stick to your knitting, which meant stay in packaging. It just didn't sit right for me. I thought, I don't reckon that is my knitting and I don't think you have to stay that narrowly focused. I think what I understand, broadly speaking, is manufacturing. Manufacturing, distribution, sales, and therefore my skill set was much, much wider than just saying, I have to be in packaging, therefore let's start another packaging business. And so I thought, well, what, do we, what can I manufacture that I would enjoy? And I like the food space. Uh, dairy has been a space that attracts strong multiples, always has. And so, you know, with the thought in mind that probably would be a business that I'd sell at some point, go into a category that attracts strong multiples. Dairy is a good space in Australia. We've got great milk, we've got produce that the rest of the world sees as being clean and attractive. And I thought that there was a space in, not really a yoghurt brand, for like a nudie juice, for example. With a bit of emotion and a bit of fun attached to it, I didn't think there was that. And I couldn't really see a good organic yoghurt being distributed largely or through the mainstream channels, through Coles and Woolies. And so when I went and researched, obviously, US and Europe, found that, A, I thought there was some room for significant improvement in product quality. Like if you go to France, you eat incredible yoghurts. So we brought a bit of that. And then when you go to the States, what you see is organic yoghurt, or a lot of organic products, sold massively through their big supermarket chains. I think that was the biggest thing I figured. You can't just sell organic produce through mum and dad retailers. It's always going to be very expensive because of the cost to service those retailers. You know, so an organic tub of yoghurt is costing you nine bucks if you go down to a mum and dad organic store. We were selling it at 650, which was just the, virtually the same price as a Jalna or something. So suddenly a consumer goes in and goes, oh, it's a good looking pack, great product when they got it home and priced pretty much similarly to non-organic, you know, competitors, give it a go. And that's literally what we backed ourselves on that basis. Now, Woolworths were great. They gave us four, four products in 400 stores. By the time we sold, we had 
27 products in 700 stores with them and, and 27 products in 700 Coles stores as well. So you can see the kind of growth of the business over that you know, three year period really. And how did you get into Coles and Woolworths from the outset, even with those four products? How did you go about that? Was it sort of constant you know, communication with them or was it driven by customer demand? Or I think they recognised, they wanted to go more down that path of having um, better for you products and so they were very much on that journey. Um, I'd set up an advisory board when I started um, when I started 5am and one of the guys on that advisory board, Don Fraser, was an ex-director um, of um, one of the major supermarkets, Woolies, and so he was able to secure us a meeting with the then CEO, um, Greg Foran, Greg Foran, who went on to run Walmart actually. Uh, and so the guys from the US came down because we were, at one point we were going to do a joint venture with the leading organic yogurt retailer in, or uh, manufacturer in the US. So their head guy came down, we got a meeting with uh, Greg Foran, he said look, sounds great, we'll give you support. There was no agreement or contract or whatever, it was a handshake to say if you can deliver on what you say you're going to deliver, um, we'll support you. So we went away, built the factory and started getting ready to supply these guys, which we did, I think, a year after that meeting with Greg Ferran. A final one before we move on to Bladnock. Talk to me about the, the feeling or the experience that you have once you sold the business in, in 2014, as I mentioned, for $80 million. Was it a, a feeling of elation, relief? What's that like when the money finally comes through? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, mixed emotions because you know, it's, it was nice to, we'd had, we had put everything on, we'd mortgage the house and we'd take an enormous amount of risk to build 5am. It wasn't like it was some side investment that didn't matter whether it worked or not, it was, it was all or nothing. And so from a financial perspective, massive relief that, you know, the house was now off the, you know, didn't, off the mortgage and all that sort of stuff. Um, but also, Definitely, I don't know if the word was sadness, but you know, this, the brand had a lot of us in it. Like it was around early mornings and healthy living and you know, there was surfing and yoga and, and building this thing from nothing to something that was widely distributed in Australia and had a, built up a great following. It was the fastest growing organic product in Australia at one stage there and it really developed a good life of its own. There's definitely a feeling of a little bit of sadness that it's like when a kid leaves home probably, you're happy for them but you're sad. And so it was a bit of that. I think knowing that we were going to sell, I'd started putting my mind to well, what could we do next and that was kind of the birth of thinking about the um, premium whisky space. So. Let's talk about Bladnock Distillery and the origins of that for you in, t in terms of your ownership. You purchased the business in 2015 I think for some $40 million or thereabouts. Where did your interest in whiskey come from? From my father. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of Friday nights sitting and chatting with him and him telling me about his week and me telling him about my week and, and starting to drink whiskey as an 18 year old and enjoying whiskey when it was not really very cool. Uh, everyone was drinking beer and maybe bourbon, but you know, whiskey was definitely for old men. And, it was just something I enjoyed. And so it was a lifelong love of whiskey was the first thing. So there was the huge passion for the, for the category. But again, it was much, much more about the actual business opportunity. I said before, you know, we enjoy building businesses and brands. And so the opportunity to build a brand that could, has the potential to go global rather than focused on one market, like we were with 5am. The opportunity to supply multiple markets through one production plant. Again, with yogurt, you're very constricted because of shelf life. So you can really only supply Australia. I mean, you can do a bit of air freight into Asia, but it kind of kills the pricing. You know, with whiskey, of course, completely, the world's your oyster because there's nothing, you know, whiskey just gets better with age and of course you can bottle it and export it. So that really appealed to me, opportunity to build a brand at a more sophisticated level. We're in a different space. I don't know, this business hasn't been bought or built, is being built to be sold um, like 5am was. But if it does, again, multiples are very, very strong in whiskey and in premium spirits. So when I look at it from all the business reasons and then you put it with my love of the actual product and of whiskey, it was just a, it was kind of a no-brainer. 
and it was an irresistible opportunity because I, you know, so when we sold 5am I, I wanted to have a whiskey business but again what do you really know about it? Nothing other than you like whiskey and so I'd been and started doing research and we were literally going to build a, I wanted it to be Scotch whiskey, I didn't want it to be Australian whiskey or any other, I wanted it to be Scotch whiskey because again I'd grown up with that thing of it's Scotch, you know, there's, it's like champagne, it's Scotch, you know. And so we'd started looking to build a distillery from scratch in Scotland. We'd bought land, we'd actually bought you know, 20 acres of land and we were thinking about building. And that's when the Bladnock thing came around. Actually it never gone broke or anything, just that it was being run by two brothers who were having a lot of, um, couldn't agree with each other. And, and so they ran a process, Ernst & Young ran a process uh, globally to see who wanted to buy it. I think at that time, Bladnock would certainly not have been an appealing proposition to any of the big guys because they hadn't produced liquid for eight years. A lot of issues, a lot of issues. So you really had to look at it from a much more entrepreneurial angle and say, do you see enough there that it's going to be worth it? Because it's, an, it's not an insignificant, you say, the purchase price, but you, you know, double that when you want to invest in it and bring on, redo the distillery systems, people, lay down stock. It's been a very significant project. And so you've got to have a really strong belief that there was enough there, which there was. Because, you know, we bought a 203-year-old distillery on 60 acres of land with a river running right through the middle of it. You know, all that history. And just a beautiful, a lovely product. You know, very, the lowlands produces a beautiful grassy type of single malt. I think the aged inventory when we bought the, the, the plant was valued at four million pounds. You know, the aged inventory, just the inventory is now valued at 11 million pounds. So you can see just from that side of it, you can kind of get a feel for what the journey has been in terms of reinvesting back into those, the brands, the liquid quality, the people, the team. And it's been a great journey, but it's been pretty tough too. <laughs> I've got to say, it's been probably a lot harder than I thought. But in the end, where we, well, it's not the end, but where we are now is, is pretty good too. We're in a really great space. We're making solid money. We've built a really strong business. We've got a great, great team, got great brands. And I think it's in the great thing about a category like whiskey, I think once you break through, which is what we've been doing, really whilst it had the 200 years, it was virtually like another startup. And that, I think that's the part I underestimated because they hadn't made liquid for eight years, they really didn't have much momentum. So in many ways I had to start again, but having been through that over the past three or four years, once we, you can kind of get to a position of relative stability and, and maturity, we're not a mature business, we're getting there. It's actually an incredibly strong category because you just, I mean, just laying down whiskey itself, the economics of the whiskey category are incredibly strong. You know, you can you double, triple your investment over a period of 10 years. And so it's an incredible category to be a part of and, and one that I thoroughly enjoy. I love going to Scotland when I can. It's been a couple of years now with COVID, obviously. Um, or will be by the time I get back there. Uh, but I love going. I love being part of the Scotch whisky industry. They're amazing people and families and businesses. Talk to me about the, the business today in terms of production, where, the, where it's stocked. Again, when we bought it, there was a production capacity on the distillery of 200,000 litres. We got that removed and um, we built a plant that was capable of running 1.5 million litres per annum. This year we ran, I think, 1.48 you know, million litres of, dis of distilling. And so we're completely full. We're running 24-7, which is great. Some of that whisky is being sold to brokers and things that then go and deal with people that want to invest in the whisky category. And of course, most of it is being laid down as, you know, Bladnock fillings for future years. So we employed a guy named Nick Savage, Dr. Nick Savage from Macallan. He was the head master distiller of Macallan, came across to us two years ago. He's put a lot of kind of thought and planning around how do we want this range to look. That's another thing with whisky, you don't plan for Today, you actually have to plan for the next 10, 15 years, because what's today is your 15-year-old, obviously. So you want a kind of consistent laydown of liquid and a consistent drawdown of your aged inventory so that you can balance the portfolio, basically. 
So you want enough of everything. So you never want to sell out of any, like, you know, we've got some 30-year-old, we've got some 25-year-old. You don't want to sell out of any of it because that's your brand story and that's your brand history. So there's always this fine balance. And again, I think coming into the whiskey category from outside, there was a hell of a lot of learnings for me. I really had to learn a lot. And it's those types of nuances that you just don't appreciate when you're sitting outside of being a, you know, a distillery owner is that you've got to balance all this stuff. You just don't go and sell as much whiskey as you can to maximise your P&L. You actually want a strong balance sheet of aged inventory as well because you need that portfolio, you need the brand story. So uh, we're in 35 markets or something with 10 key markets. Again, I think we could probably sell more. We could have a stronger P&L you know, by selling more, but we don't want to do that because you've got to balance it with making sure that there is um, there's enough stock there to, to ensure the continuity of the brand. And then, of course, in 2017, when we started distilling under my ownership, we've been laying down a fair bit. So suddenly now that's three-year-old, which is legal Scotch whisky. So we've got quite a bit of new Bladnock fillings coming through. And every year now we increase by 50,000 litres or something so that in 10 years we'll have a really healthy stock holding of aged inventory. That's sort of the plan from a, from a product perspective. Just in terms of brand positioning, it's obviously a, a competitive market. So how do you differentiate your product to, to the other Scotch whiskies on the market? Or at least how do you sell that differentiation to the consumer? Again, it's a slightly different category in that I remember in yogurt, there was a little bit more about trying to be the best, you know, are we the best tasting, are we the, most, the healthiest product, you know, ingredient list or whatever, and, you know, a lot, kind of a lot of, I remember with us and Jalna and a few other guys, there's a lot of Chobani, a bit of back and forth about, you know, in the social media space. I don't think you find that in whiskey, for example, because there's really no such thing as the best, it's a taste. You know, you've got regions, you've got countries, you've got Japan, you've got, a, you know, you've got Scotland. Within Scotland you've got Highlands whisky, you've got Islay, you've got, you know, you've got all these different regions, Lowlands. So first of all that differentiates the taste profile of the consumer that's going to buy your product. Then there's a lot just around, you know, what's the story of the distillery? As I said, we've got all this history and provenance attached to us. So each distillery has an incredible story and history and unique taste. And so I think whisky is not so much about trying to be the best on all those fronts. It's about saying, well, this is us, this is our story, this is our product. We believe that they're all great. You know, it's a great tasting product. It's, you know, it's beautifully presented. It's well priced. We're not trying to, we're not taking the piss. We're not, you know, selling a three-year-old at $200 a bottle, which you do see. That happens a bit in Australian whiskey, particularly some very high pricing for some very young products. We don't do that. We price our products fairly. And so I think, you know, the consumer ultimately gets, you know, an understanding of all of that and you start to grow. Bladnock's in a really great space and it's got a really, really loyal, um, engaged and sort of informed group of, of customers. And we'll do a release, it'll sell out online in, you know, in a day. You never take it for granted and you're always reinvesting in your brands, in your products, in your team, in your distribution capacity. So you get to have a dram on a Friday night and, and enjoy it, you know, it's a, as I said, it's a brilliant category to be a part of and certainly got a lot of upside. Moving away from your business interests, let's discuss your foundation, the Pryor Family Foundation. Why was it so important to you to create your own foundation and, and what are you trying to achieve with it? I don't know, I just had always, I kind of, through my, you know, 20s into my early 30s, I just had a really strong sense that there was uh, we had a responsibility to do more, or as an, I don't mean us personally, but as a community, for people that were less well off than we were, you know. I remember when, before we sold 5am, I had a thing, I had a picture from, I used to do a bit of work with World Vision, just a few sponsorships, but I also knew one of their CEO, and I sat on an advisory board there for a while in my early 30s. I had a photo of a, you know, a kid from sub-Saharan Africa who was se severely malnourished, and I, I said to Sally, my wife, I said, you know, I want to build a business and sell it so that we're in a position where we can donate at least half a million dollars a year to, to charities. The fundamental driver in the first, you know, if, of building was, of course we wanted, you know, to, to have our own financial independence, but there was this kind of undercurrent of the foundation. And so now, then having sold 5am, you know, we'd made that call and we put, 
uh, quite honestly quite a lot of the money into a foundation. And we're now in a position where we donate you know, close to $2 million a year um, to the various philanthropic organisations that we work with. And it's, so it's really just about wanting to you know, make a meaningful contribution back to society. I think there's so many issues and areas where um, private money is needed. Of course you've got governments doing their bit, but sometimes, and we've tried to model the, the Prior Foundation around the same approach we take in business, which is a little bit more entrepreneurial. We're willing to get in and have a go at things, whereas a lot of family foundations want to see a proven history of who sponsored them before, is the government sponsoring them, has it worked? We actually say, we don't need all any of that. We back the people, for the example, the project we did with Greening Australia, we were the first people that sponsored that gully restoration program. We put in half a million dollars. Queensland government matched that, I think, two to one. And now it's a $30 million a year initiative, which they run. So we were like the seed funder. At the moment, citizens of the Great Barrier Reef, they're doing a big thing called the Census Project, where they're mapping the reef. Half the reef has never been mapped before. Again, we backed the people, backed the technology, and we, we were the first people in there. So it's sort of like, what, we, what do we do well as entrepreneurs or as an entrepreneurial business or foundation? We can see opportunities and believe we can identify good people to work with, then let's back that and give them a start. Because sometimes they need that to be able to then go out to other foundations, you know, large foundations, the Ramsey Foundation or something, and government to find other sources of money with being able to say, we've already got the Pry Foundation on board, they've put in half a million bucks. That makes a massive difference. And so look, it's just an incredibly rewarding, and I can see that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 50, hopefully a long way to go in my career and life. And there'll be a time where, you know, I'm surfing and running, doing a bit of, you know, the business type stuff, but doing a lot in the philanthropic space. And I think it's so rewarding. So in a way, you build it for your own enjoyment as well, because you're giving back to community, giving back to the land, you know, having that incredible connection with Indigenous culture. And so there's an amazing amount of intrinsic reward in it. Reflecting on your career, is there anything that you would do differently? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, yeah. I mean, you always get asked that question. And kind of, I think the absolutely honest answer is no, because you, you're in the position you're in. You can't change it and you learn so much from the things that you've done wrong. But of course, you know, there's so many. I mean, God, my journey of the story of 5am and here at Bladnock has been riddled with things we've done wrong. I think anyone that tells you they've executed a business to perfection, maybe they have, but I don't know. It certainly hasn't been my... I think you always make mistakes. The, the key is not, I think, identifying, you know, okay, that, well, that was a mistake and I would never do it again. For me is... How did you learn from that mistake? Like, what did you do differently? So you either employed the wrong person or you entered the wrong market or you, you, know, you made a wrong call on something really significant. What was the reflection that you had both as a person and then as a business? So I'm always, even now, you know, we, get, you know, we have bad news, we have setbacks. What are we doing differently next time around? Because if you don't learn from it, you see businesses and you see organisations that are run in that kind of, you know, a bit of hubris and a bit of arrogance that we, we've got it all and we're doing, we're flying, and, you know, no one can teach us anything. They're primed for a fall because, you know, you, you've got to take your, you know, when you get a bit of, bit of pill, you've got to swallow it. And you've got to say, right, what were the learnings? Do we need to communicate better? Do we need to, you know, know our brands better? Do we need to price our products better? You know, was the organisation heading in the wrong way in terms of the type of people we were employing? All that sort of stuff. So there's a process of reflecting, learning, and then implementing your new, new approach. So I see that kind of a become, business to me is much more uh, than just building, and it's much more just a commercial thing. It's about how are you improving as a person, how are you improving as an organisation, what are the values and what's the culture of the team that you're building, and how does that contribute to success? Because I think that ultimately, when you see really successful businesses and even sporting organisations that have, over a long period of time, not a flash in the pan, they've got great culture, they've got great values, they've got great people. And that stuff doesn't just come overnight, you know. That has to be invested in, worked on, learned from, you know, and put into practice over a long period of time. My final question is, what does the next five years look like for Bladnock as a business and then also for David Pryor as a person? 
You know, we are going through a process probably the end of this year around bringing in a partner. And so I think the business is in, you know, as I said before, really good shape, making good money and is primed to bring in probably one of the trade guys as a significant minority, hopefully. See how that works out. But, you know, a 30% investor um, would, I think, really allow the business to take that next step. And what is the next decade? You know, it's betting down those key markets, India, the US, maybe ramping up production, maybe going to a 3 million litre capacity distillery. Markets that we're already in, you know, expanding your foot footprint through, you know, if you bring in a, I don't know, whoever, Pernod Ricard, for example, they've got, you know, established and very, very significant and mature distribution channels, which is going to take us a long time to build. And so I think that's kind of the next step is to continue to build on you know, all the great success and hard work that we've done, but let the brands and the business take its next, its next incarnation, which is, you know, when I bought it, I really said it's such a, Bladnock Distillery is such a significant part of that part of Scotland and that region, and it could have gone either way. Honestly, it could have, it could have gone, you know, it could have been no more at the point that I bought it. And to bring it back to life and to bring it back stronger than it's ever been, there's no doubt about that, um, is incredibly rewarding for me and for the team there, some of whom, you know, their grandfathers worked for Bladnock. And so to, to then position it to say, right, we're not here to build a great brand for five years, we want to build this thing for the next generation. You know, we want Bladnock to be there for the next 100 years. It's been there 203 years. Of course we want it to be there for another 203 years. So what's going to achieve that? So I think that's the next step. I think as part of that, you asked what's the next five years for me, part of that might be a little bit of a rebalancing of how I kind of spend my, my weeks and my months. And, you know, honestly, it sounds, sounds um, trite or whatever, but a bit more time in the ocean. You know, if I could be surfing every day, I would. And I, you know, I surf a lot and I'm incredibly grateful for that. But probably being a bit closer to the ocean more of the time, you know, more time with my wife and daughter and getting my daughter out in the ocean as much as I can spending a lot of time in the philanth you know, philanthropic space, getting really immersed in that, being more of an operator than just a, someone that provides funds. I, I think that'll, that'll kind of round it out, you know, staying active and engaged in my business life, heavily involved in the philanthropic space and spending as much time by the ocean as I can. And drinking whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, you on this morning. I really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing what does uh, what does hold for you in the next five, ten, fifteen years. Thanks again for the Cheers, opportunity. Cheers, Rob. Enjoyed the chat. Thank you.